Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly broadcast of the This Week in Science podcast. Woohoo! We are here. We're going to talk about science. We're going to do a podcast thingy. It's a thingy because it's like video, and then it'll be a podcast, you know, and there might be editing between this video thing and the podcast thing. So they're not exactly the same all the time. And the one that ends up on the radio is totally different from this, very different. Co-hosts, are you ready to science? So ready. Yeah. So ready. We're ready to science. So let us bring the show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 865, recorded on Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. How to pronounce science. I think I did it right. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with bugs, personality, and words. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Democracy. The ability of a people to choose their leaders and hold influence over their government is the greatest threat to world governments. At least to those governments that do not have elected leaders. Uh, while democracy is something we kind of think of as a given in the Western world, 37% of the planet's humans are living in authoritarian regimes. In these authoritarian regimes, the people have limited freedoms, highly controlled access to information, and essentially no rights that cannot be taken away from them. What we call in misinformation is often the only information in these regimes. Try to imagine for a moment that if all of the information you had access to, if every media outlet, website, and social media platform only presented you with false narratives, then I can tell you there is no pandemic virus, no global warming, and no such thing as cancer. Not only did America win in every goal, goal at every event in the Winter Olympics, but I, your glorious leader, personally competed in and won each of those events. While that can sound ridiculous, Amin Dinejad claimed Iran had no homosexuals. State media claimed Kim Jong-il didn't defecate. That North Korea had cured cancer and AIDS, and that they had found an actual unicorn lair. China posts around 500 million fake profile pro-government posts on social media every year. Right now, Russian media is reporting that they are fighting fascist Nazis and that Ukrainians are meeting the Russian troops with flowers and homemade pies. And in the U.S., there was a recent attempt to overturn a Democratic election with propaganda and fraudulent electors. 37% of your fellow humans are living under regimes of state-sponsored misinformation. 37% of your fellow humans cannot vote, cannot speak their minds in public, and do not have basic human rights protections. 37% of your fellow humans will live and die without knowing the simple joys of This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about science. And yes, the show does go on even as there are many human rights offenses around the world. And it's good to acknowledge those and to know that we have the privilege of taking this time to appreciate science. 
I will also acknowledge that even though um, we like to think we have a, a full representative democracy here in the United States, there are lots of people who don't have proper access to a vote. So that's also a weird asterisk on that that I just want to well, mention. Uh, I'll, I'll throw science. out science. It's a thing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> over the last uh, decade, we have been downgraded in the United States from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. Hmm. Still democracy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh, just barely. Yeah. Uh, All right. And it, it has to do with our political system that can actually elect the person who got the less votes, which is a right. weird compared to most democracies. Usually it's like, no, you just do the math. But you know what's behind yeah. that? It's statistics and math and various systems that we can use. So let's dive uh, into the science for the week. We're not going to we're not going to stick to the policy, except for maybe my first little. <laughs> stories at the very beginning of the story time on this week's show i have we have a great show ahead of course and we are so glad that you're joining us today yeah. i have stories about what did i bring i brought some science and policy yes i did i also brought a lot of bugs and i brought some brains Woo digging into them well not digging into them imaging them it'll be fun Justin, what'd you bring? I have microbiome and energy levels. All right. I have just good news, cancer edition. And I have a bunch of fake news, two different fake news uh, studies that use Twitter. Ah, fake news. Blair, what is in the animal corner? I have masks and monkeys, or should I say, um, I guess, technically masks and primates. So the, oh, the, the be, animal science police don't come for me. <laughs> be accurate. This is there are science monkeys program. in both stories, but my second story also has apes. So it would be more accurate to say masks and primates. Interesting. One of my stories has uh, is, is got a core overlap of apes and masks as well. But I, oh. I don't think it's the same story. No. The only apes in my stories are the human ape. <laughs> So let's jump into the science right here, right now. You're here for this science program. I want to remind you that subscribing to the Twist podcast, if you have not done so, is easy to do on your favorite podcast platform. Just go wherever you find podcasts and look for This Week in Science if you are interested in finding us as a podcast. We also stream weekly live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Again, look for This Week in Science. And we are also Twist Science on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram. Woo! All of these different ways to find us, but the best one is to go to our website, twists.org. All right, now all that bookkeeping is done. Whew. It's science time. Well, actually, it's science and policy time. I want to just dive right into the, the big elephant in the room. Um, what is coming next for the U.S. and the world when it comes to science and policy? Just a day after the IPCC released on Monday its latest and most dire report on climate change impacts, adaptations, and vulnerabilities, really not a pretty picture, Biden gave a State of the Union address that spoke of climate change only twice with respect to economics, um, basically. And while the IPCC report warns of future disease spread, the CDC has released new mask guidelines that basically put the onus on the individual to be careful when it comes to wearing masks. And the White House just today released a new pandemic preparedness plan that actually does look compre comprehensive enough to help us through future COVID variants and maybe future pandemics. But as we know, time will tell. So how will it go? Any opinions? Any thoughts on State of the uh, Union, which, which, CDC oh. mask mandates, climate change, IPCC report? Yeah. We've got a big bunch of science policy things it's, going I on. I mean, right the, mas the mask thing, <laughs> it depends what the goal is, I think. So I, I heard uh, the, what's, what's her name? Um, the press secretary, um, Wolinsky. I think um, I heard her. No, yeah, she's Walensky is the CDC director. Oh, no. So I'm thinking about the the Jen press Saki. secretary. Saki. There we Saki, go. Saki, yeah. I get them confused because they're both talking about COVID all the time. <laughs> um, but she talked about, I think actually both of them did talk about giving people a break, right? 
And so I think they both are being very clear now and saying, you're going to have to put the mask back on. You're just trying to give you a break, which I, okay. I don't know. I'm just, it feels odd to give up partially. We're going to give up and let you take your mask off, but we're still going to try to catch up again later when that causes a later surge. Yeah. I had heard uh, for, from many people online, epidemiologists, public, public health uh, experts who are upset about the level at which it was deemed all right to remove the masks. But as Walensky said today in the White House press briefing related to the pandemic preparedness plan, it's different in terms, the numbers now are different in terms, in comparison to numbers, say, last June or July, because now we have more people vaccinated. Omicron is less severe. We have generally less severe. We also have more treatments like Pfizer's pill, the antibody, uh, the antivirals, antibody uh, neutralizing agents. We've got a lot better therapies and people are not ending up in the hospital as much anymore. And so they are saying that their their judgment for the level at which they deem it okay to remove masks is different now mm -hmm. than it used to be. And I think that's the hard part is because if you're trying to follow along with just the numbers, it looks like it's much worse than it mm -hmm. was even six, eight months ago still, yet the outcomes are different. And so it is a different situation. And I think that's part of the problem with the entire pandemic is there's not been a way to just look at mm -hmm. it in a, in a just in a single in a single layer it's a it's right. it's got multiple layers of complexity that all tie together yeah it's nuanced and yes. um and if you're not an expert in that area how you don't know why necessarily yeah well I, also I our it, media yeah. doesn't move in the space of nuance anymore is oh the other no problem. we move in the space of outrage mm -hmm. and <laughs> like two second outrage. bites yeah one <laughs> sentence at a time yeah yeah, yeah, but you know what it sounds like to me is, uh, you know, car accident, uh, death by car accident's down. Uh, wait a minute, uh, go ahead and take the seatbelts off, folks. Uh, we don't need to wear them for a while because uh, the numbers went down. Isn't that mean it's been working? It's been <laughs> working, that, yeah. Doesn't that yeah. mean, like, doesn't it mean that, like, we've gotten more compliance, that we've gotten, like, everybody's got the message, everybody's got the, the packets of masks, one in the car, a couple in the in the entryway, so you can slap one on when you leave the house or answer the door. Like, didn't, isn't it because we got good at it that <laughs> it's yes. better? Like, yeah. Human I behavior, don't... it does affect yeah. the outcome, yeah. And it, it very much feels like an all or nothing, right? So, like... I would I would be thinking like, oh, if you keep your masks on, the numbers are so good. If you keep your masks on, you can go hang out with your friends. You can travel. You can go to the movies. You can do these other things as opposed to take off the mask and do it all. It's, I think I think that's that's the miss, right? Like we slipped up. We had the Omicron issue. I didn't see my parents for six weeks because I was afraid to be near them. And that despite having masked and being vaccinated, boosted and all these other things, suddenly we had to pull way back. I wasn't going yep. to crowded spaces. I wasn't going to the mall. I wasn't doing all these yep. things, right? And so, Even though you had done all the things that you were told yeah. to do and that caused right. frustration. And so, yeah, the psychology but, of this. But is, that's also, but, that's isn't that also partly because you were aware that even though you did all the things that were required of you, that that's not the guarantee, that it's not immunity, that that's not the same right. thing. Well, I mean, but that's I, the thing, right? I had the keep... urge to to go and lick door handles when I got my first shot. You mean but when you were nothing... two years old? Yeah. His no, literal no, first no, no. shot when he was six no, months. The, the first, uh, the first, uh, yeah, the, the first vaccine yeah. shot uh, for yeah. the, for the COVID. But yep. it didn't, it was not helping me with that at all. Like whatever you yeah. can get from licking door handles, you would still get uh, even with the shot. But it, you know, yep. there was this desire like, now I don't have to worry or think about it anymore. Right. But that wasn't ever true. Yeah. So the, so what's go, what's happening here is very interesting because we had the everybody work together 
let's collaborate and try and protect everyone approach. And now it's the, ah, just protect yourself, whatever your risk is good approach. And this doesn't work well. Also, if you put it in parallel or in comparison to like what's happening with climate change and the efforts we haven't done so far, which have been like, oh, do it yourself. And now we have to push towards, hey, everybody, we really, we all really need to work on this together. Let's get the government involved. Let's get all this stuff, regulations, and let's make this work. So I don't know. There are a lot of a lot of parallels here, a lot of differences in the way these two scientific mm-hmm. issues are playing out, though, that I find very interesting. And we'll see where it goes. But I wanted to jump from here to oh. Blair's story. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. She has a mask story. Yes. Next. Yes. So speaking of these disposable face masks that everyone should be wearing, they're destroying the environment. So <laughs> it's <laughs> it's bad. Here's the thing. Um, you know, we've talked about the litter from face masks before on the show, but this is about the chemicals leaching from face masks in tide pools. Mm. Yes, this is, uh, um, <laughs> this, 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 this is the picture, the picture of a tide pool masks full of masks. In tide pools. <laughs> so, first of all, important <laughs> to remember that like uh, any uh, trash on the ground can eventually make its way to a waterway, right? So any litter yeah. can end up in water. And once it ends up in a river, it can end up in, you know, or through a storm drain or whatever, drain or whatever can end up making its way to the ocean and it can get caught in a tide pool. But also, there are also probably just people throwing them on the ground at the beach, too. Let's let's be real. Uh, So, quote, we're seeing more and more masks in rocky pools, says Laurent Seron, a marine ecologist at the French Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique who will present the new research um, coming up at, oh, actually at a meeting tomorrow of Ocean Sciences. This could cascade up the food chain and up to us. Uh, They are seeing altered behaviors in tide pool animals that appear to be associated with the chemicals leaching from disposable masks. That includes signs of stress, reduced ability to detect makes, and reduced reproduction. And so all of those things are coming most likely from the plastic polymers, polypropylene, which is what masks are made out of. Yes, masks are made out of plastic. And so those that same po- plastic polymer has previously been shown to have negative effects on aquatic organisms. So it's not surprising. But so they actually looked at three different types of animals, blue mussels, snails, copepods. They all had adverse effects to the leached chemicals. Uh, all of them were different. Blue mussels had showed a stress response, moved away, gathered together, aggregated, looked like they were freaked out. Snails, they were less vigilant after being exposed, so they actually messed up their stress response, response, which increased their likelihood of being eaten, which also then brings the chemicals up the food chain. And then copepods had trouble reproducing because of it. They couldn't find the pheromone trails of females. So all that to say, those disposable masks are not just yucky litter. They're also causing chemical issues. So to Kiki's point, um, the thing that I was thinking about with your IPCC thing is that we re- it really feels like society was getting really concerned about climate change. And then the pandemic happened and it was like, ah, forget about that. We got to worry about this. <laughs> and so we really have to figure out how to do both at the same time because they're connected. The environmental issues that are going to kill us and the pandemic-based issues that are going to kill us, they they can work in tandem in bad ways. And I was actually just talking to Sodi about how all these COVID tests have all these plastic pieces in them and it's creating litter and it's creating more plastic waste and I understand at a certain point you have to throw caution to the wind for human health, but after you have a second to assess how you're doing things, it might be good to To reassess (laughs) on the impact that you have by all these plastics that you're using in this Mm -hmm. pandemic. Because yes, most of these uh, masks that are in tide pools are probably from inconsiderate people littering, but some of them could be blown off the back of a garbage truck or blows out of your dumpster after you put your trash very carefully in the dumpster. Or like I said, could be pushed downstream. There's a million ways that that stuff could end up out there. Off of a garbage barge. (laughs) Garbage barges. We shouldn't even have these things. You know we do. (laughs) But we do. Yeah. 
So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting that speaking of the IPCC report uh, and, and and the lack of attention uh, there seems to be t- towards uh, global warming at the moment, I actually heard it mentioned uh, quite specifically addressed in a, in a few speeches very recently related to the invasion of Ukraine, uh, where people are saying, "Hey, you know what, Europe." Uh, I think it was it was a, I think it was a European Union or a NATO speech. There's been so many lately. Uh, but saying if they had energy independence and alternative fuels, you wouldn't need to be fueling the geopolitical uh, yeah. show Certainly. that's uh, taking place elsewhere. So it, it did get it did work its way in. At least somebody was like, this is also part of the fossil fuel problem, isn't that? Some of the regimes that have a lot of fossil fuels are doing bad things with the money that we're giving them for them. Uh-huh. And as long as we were to uh, get to our energy independence using sustainable fuels and not uh, relying on the supplies that we already have, like coal from West Virginia, which is like what Senator Manchin is probably pushing forward. But yeah, so it's maintaining and subsidizing those sustainable forms so that we can get there faster. So that this kind of back and forth and battling, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just not as big a deal. Yeah. Yeah. And along the lines of the uh, face masks, there's a whole new modeling study that came out this week uh, from Chalmers University of Technology uh, that this is called modeling the direct virus exposure risk associated with respiratory events. And uh, it's based on trying to upgrade the old model that was developed for respiratory viruses back in 1934 and actually is too simplified to account for the complexity of transmission. And so this new model does that and takes masks into account. And oh, it's another confirmation that masks actually do work. So even though the plastic waste is bad, if you're using, uh, if it, masks are still good and you can One use them to protect <laughs> yeah, yeah. others. So, <laughs> yes. so, so as long as we are in the pandemic, them. if you have a respiratory virus, you don't know what it is, maybe you have the flu. Wear a mask. You can protect people. This is now, it's not just going to be a SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 issue. It's going to be respiratory viruses kind of moving forward. I sure hope they don't go away for that. I really wish people would wear them when they're sick forever after this. I don't want your cold. I don't want your cold. Um, Justin, oops, I keep sharing all sorts of things, don't I? I'm sharing all my screens, looking at all sorts of Give stories. Us a sneak peek. Snakety pickities at stories to come, but I believe Justin has a story about microbes. Yeah, this is uh, Clarkson University researchers. They found a correlative link between energy levels and the gut microbiome. Uh, associate professor of physical therapy, Ali Bulani, and his team searched the microbiome for associations between the microflora of, that make up the gut, the bacteria and such in there. And self-reported personality traits or mood ratings of uh, four categories. They had mental energy, mental fatigue, physical energy, and physical fatigue. The four moods of 20 participants, which is not a big sample size, were assessed by survey and the gut uh, microbiome and the metabolome, uh, which is the things that are being made by the microbiome, uh, were determined from RNA analysis and some untargeted metabolics analysis, respectively. So they found uh, some of the most prominent phyla uh, was only negatively correlated with physical fatigue. The second most predominant uh, phyla that they found, uh, Firmicutes, had members that correlated with all of the traits, which is an interesting hit. Uh, Bacteria anneostrips was uh, positively correlated with mental energy, negatively with mental fatigue and physical fatigue, respectively. So they're starting to now say, okay, hey, these people are saying they've got energy and that's correlating with a specific bacteria in their gut. Diet influenced the gut microbiota composition of the participants, and only one food group was correlated throughout all four of the different moods, seeming to affect all of them based on this one food group which was 
processed meat. And it, it was, was great, uh, right? It totally was good for energy and all. Like it, it was just. It was. It was that uh, bacon it, it was, and the that that <laughs> salted it ham. <laughs> positively, <laughs> with mental fatigue, and positively with physical fatigue. Meaning, if don't you eat had, it. If you had, it had the process. It'll make you meat, take a nap. <laughs> it uh, affected the microbiome. And that created mental fatigue and meant or was correlated with mental fatigue and physical fatigue. And negatively, meaning if you didn't have it, you had a higher chance of having less of the bacteria that were leading towards uh, or that were deficient in uh, mental energy and physical energy. Anyway, it's just a correlative with a small sample size. And even the scientists are like, ah, we need a larger study to confirm and explore this further. But uh, they were a little further. They found the, the amino acids and enzymes and cofactors that are produced by the gut microbiota that were correlated to these different things. This is uh, quoting uh, Bulani, Ali Bulani. These new findings support my previous work where we found that feelings of energy are associated with metabolic processes, while feelings of fatigue are associated with inflammatory processes. Since we're still learning about the gut microbiome, we don't know whether if we try to change our personality trait, we might see a change in the microbiome, or if we try to change our gut mm -hmm. microbiome, would we be then able to see the difference of the personality trait? That's what Additionally, I was wondering too, yeah. So, and it's, oh, there's a study that I was going to have last week that I didn't, uh, we didn't end up doing because I didn't end up joining the show, which is they had to do one of these studies on heart patients where they had looked at, uh, hey, here's a gut microbiome. A configuration uh, that we see that tracks with correlates with heart disease. Uh, and what they, what they, the problem was they ended up finding that half of that, which was correlating with heart disease actually correlated with being on a heart medica medication. <laughs> so, so previous to that, it wasn't. And then, they, so they, there's a lot of noise in these things is basically yeah. what I'm saying is that you have to suss out what is causing what, uh, what is, what's coming before, what's coming after, what's being influenced by diet versus mood? Is yeah. that influencing back and forth? But uh, I found that to be an interesting, uh, an interesting first uh, survey to, to maybe drill down and find those, those connections between our diet and energy level that aren't the food. They are the food. Mm -hmm. The nutritionist is right. The processed meat is what's making you sluggish, but it's not the meat's fault. It's what it's feeding in your gut. Right. right. It's what it's what populations <laughs> it facilitates growth of. So it is the food. Yeah. It's just the food it is, it is the, the first food. domino. It's the mechanism. The yeah. mechanism has been missing. So then you might, you, you know, then you could possibly have though with this, you could have a probiotic enriched bacon right. but you would but you would have to you would have to keep up on it right? maybe you have to balance yeah. your bacon with probiotics maybe the problem it's, it's, is the people yeah. who are taking the bacon don't take the probiotics yeah to balance it out you gotta you gotta put in some leafy greens in there with your with your, your, your i don't bologna. know just get yourself some benefiber you're good to go is no. that is that what really this comes down what to is, is eat a salad Eat a salad. salad. No, it does. And <laughs> actually, a lot of the microbiome studies do come down to like, actually, if you eat a salad, it, it seems to fix everything. Yeah. That was a that was a Two uh, footnote. Two cups of leafy the, greens at every meal. That was a footnote to the uh, the heart study last week, which is that they found a you know this positive correlation with yeah the leafy greens and uh, the lack of uh, <laughs> microbiota that led to heart disease. Hmm. But then again, is it because the leafy greens do something or is it because you ate so many leafy greens you didn't have a chance to eat the, the bacon wrapped bologna that was deep fried? Like, it, Did you yeah, wrap the notes. bacon and bologna in lettuce leaves? <laughs> you know, very keto. I don't know. <laughs> All right, everybody. Moving away from the myths, let's move to bugs. I mean, it might not be processed meats, might not be your fiber intake that you're looking for, but researchers have, and we've talked about it on the show a few times, researchers have suggested that we should eat insects for mm -hmm. our nutrition, right? Yeah. That's a good idea. We should be, eating, we should be eating the bugs. Bug 
biomass is better on the planet in terms of the the use of yeah. nutrients and the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And it's better for us. It's high in protein, high in lots of nutrients. But that's not what this new study is about. This new study is about another reason why we should be eating bugs instead of the cows and the pigs and the chickens and all those things. Mm -hmm. It's for the plants. We should eat the bugs to help the plants. This study ah, so of then there's, there's less the bugs eating the pl uh, the plants if we just ate all the bugs ourselves. Is that what we're not nope. eating wild bugs? We're eating nope. farmed bugs. <laughs> These are farmed bugs, exactly. Okay. And as 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 Blair has brought up, yes, these are farmed bugs. And these farmed bugs, well, my picture's not coming up for some reason. Come on, picture, picture this. You're not a happy picture. Okay, well. Just describe the picture to us. This is radio anyways. Well, Aren't what, we on the radio right uh, now? Yeah. There's a nice, we're on the radio. Okay, so instead of eating the plants, I mean, eating the bugs, we can eat the plants too. But mm -hmm. it's the bug poop because you're farming the insects to eat, uh -huh. they produce a lot of waste. And they also have their exoskeletons that come off all this frass. I love that word. Frass is the, the waste of these insects. The frass is highly nutrient rich as well. And it's full of nitrogen, which we apply to soils in the form of fertilizer. And maybe we wouldn't have to apply all the excess fertilizer and have all the use of ammonia and the creation of the fertilizers if we used the frass. So if we farmed enough bugs, if we got enough people eating insects, there would be enough frass to then fertilize the plants, to then supplement the growth of the plants, which we could then eat ourselves and also use to feed more insects, which we could then eat. It is the cycle of our future diet. Yeah. <laughs> Agriculture. <laughs> hey, if you blend them up real small, I don't care. <sighs> I just, just want to taste the, smoothie. the legs. Don't eat that yet. The legs, those little, yeah, but, legs with but little hairs. Now we got to figure out what bug eating does to the microbiome. Because now I'm like wondering, the first step when you start talking about this, uh, because I just been thinking microbiome. I had the microbiome stuff, story. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I wonder if I ate nothing but termites for a year, if I could digest wood. I, I bet I bet your microbiome would be very similar to someone who eats a lot of shrimp. Probably. The one that, yeah, the one issue with insects is people who have a shellfish allergy may uh -huh. be allergic to these insects because there are uh, similar proteins in the chitinous exoskeletons of the mm. insects as well as um, shrimps, shellfish. Yep crustaceans, mm -hmm. and so on. So this is a path toward more sustainable agriculture if we only would eat the bugs. Mm. <laughs> well, give a uh, cricket tortilla chips a try. I've had them. They're pretty good. Look, I don't need almond flour. Just get me meal yes. flour. So I that is also flour. a thing. You can buy Almonds mealworm are flour. terrible for the environment. Get me the yeah. mealworms. Come on. Mealworm flour. It's gluten-free, I'd assume. <laughs> it's probably not. It's probably mostly normal flour with <sighs> some mealworm in it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. We'll look I'm it up. Sure. Mm. Yeah. We can talk about it in the after show. We'll talk about this in the after show. Yes. Let's find out what's in mealworm flour. Stay tuned to the after show or watch the YouTube video if you want to know. All right. Uh, cancer. It's cured, right, Justin? Oh, hey, Stephen, I got the segment. Uh, let's see. Uh, just good news. <clears throat> the uh, science news segment that takes on the worst possible topic and delivers just the good news about it. Cancer edition. Cancer has been cured in mice. Uh, Rice University bioengineers have successfully eradicated advanced stage. Ovarian and uh, colorectal cancer in mice. And the treatment is fast, took about six days, removed uh, tumors in 100% of the animals with ovarian cancer, and seven out of eight of the animals 
with uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, <clears throat> and this isn't one of those over the potential infinite horizon could open a door to a path for future researchers. To, no, they're talking about human clinical trials that could be happening this year. And that's because the design only included components that had previously been proven safe for human use. And the, the method of attacking the cancer is already FDA approved. The, what they did, though, is they created a mechanism for the delivery. Researchers used implantable drug factory, is what they're calling it. There's beads about the size of a pinhead uh, that were in, uh, surgically inserted near the tumor that were then uh, able to deliver continuous high doses of interleukin-2, it's a natural compound that activates white blood cells to fight cancer. Drug-producing beads uh, were implemented with some minimally invasive surgery, and each contained cells that were engineered to produce the interleukin-2, which was then encased within this protective shell, so it did sort of a like a time-release thing. You know, you, so you put in enough of it, and every day this interleukin is being generated uh, by these engineered cells, and it's right near where the tumor is. So in the newly published study, researchers placed the drug-producing beads besides the tumor within the peritoneum, which is a sac-like lining that supports intestines, ovaries, and other abdominal organs. Placement within that, ca uh, that, that uh, cavity concentrated the interleukin-2 within tumors and limited exposure elsewhere in the body. So uh, that's the, the, the delivery system right now is like an IV. So and this is quoting voice of Amanda Nash, who's one of the authors of the study. If you gave the same concentration of the protein, interleukin-2, through an IV pump, it would be extremely toxic. With the drug factories, the concentration we see elsewhere in the body away from the tumor site is actually lower than what patients have to tolerate with an IV treatment. That's the high concentration is only at the tumor site. Nash said the same general approach can be used to that they used in this study could be applied to treat cancers of the pancreas, liver, lungs, other organs. Drug factories could be placed next to tumors within the lining that surrounds those organs and most others, she says. And if a different cytokine is needed to target a specific form of cancer, the beads can be loaded with engineered cells that make that immunotherapeutic uh, compound. They, they haven't invented a drug, a new drug. They don't, it's not dependent on new drug discovery. This is about proper delivery without attacking the whole body system, but actually placing something that can express the needed compounds directly into the surrounding area. Bead's outer shell of its, uh, is a cytokine producing cell from, wait, the bead's outer shell shields the cytokine producing cells from uh, the body's natural immune system. Cells are made of material the immune system recognizes as foreign objects, but not as immediate threats. So that's how you can, uh, they can surgically Im embed this and the body doesn't just reject and attack it immediately. Because it's like, eh, that doesn't belong here, but it's not on the, the high threat list. So it doesn't get attacked immediately. Um, Right. Yeah. It doesn't have like antigens that are being presented that it's like danger. I must fight it off. Those yeah, are so, uh, so in case, uh, so yeah, there we go. Cancer, <laughs> many forms perhaps have been cured uh, so far in mice. But, in mice. Uh, but I like the fact that this is the, the specifically to uh, endeavored to not break new ground on any of the compounds or the construction of their beads uh, when they bioengineer this so that they could avoid that whole situation of, well, that sounds really great, but now we got to study it for a decade to figure out if the thing that you're using causes problem. No, they specifically like created their design parameters around things that already are approved and okay. So that it could fast but it, track. So it's, very it's just smart it's a mechanism of delivery that's very specific that avoids the systemic effects that keeps it very localized. Yes, so that it's a, yeah, so the drugs, uh, yeah. the cytokines are like super localized by the tumors, and the drugs can get in there. Yeah, the super treatment can and, get right there. And yeah. Also, a uh, a little bit of uh, this location 
uh, what would you call it? The, the way that it's surgically located within the lining of specific tissues to prevent it from also escaping. So it's a, a little bit of a combination of those two things put together uh, and pretty amazing results. Uh, these are, these were advanced stage cancer mice. So it wasn't like they were, <laughs> they gave themselves the hard challenge in the test and, and passed with, with flying colors. Yay, really the mice passed the yeah. test. Now we have to see if it works in the pigs or the sheep. The and humans. then it'll go to, or maybe the primates and the humans. We can go straight yeah. to humans with this. Everything on this list of compounds and the drugs and everything is already FDA approved. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now you just got to see if it works. Yeah. It's just the mechanism. Yeah, see if, see if the delivery system, the beads if the beads do it. Well, these little beads, they might not cause problems in the body environment but like Blair was talking about earlier we're throwing all sorts of things into our environment like plastic masks and other things that have these effects that we don't really expect them to have and uh, researchers from Oregon State University Suzanne Brander who I've actually talked to previously on the show about her work into microplastics. She and her graduate and post graduate students and postdoctoral scholars took a look at tire produced microplastics. And so in the laboratory, they created micro sized tire particles from tire tread to be the equivalent of, uh, of tire tread that would be released on roads. Tires lose massive amounts of their tread over the lifetime of a tire and these little tiny particles. We're used to seeing the big giant tire chunks that are left when a semi truck blows its tire. But in reality, every time you drive, you are there's erosion taking place and there's little that bits is of true. We're basically driving on like pencil erasers that are just slowly <laughs> getting worn down. Yeah, slowly wearing them down. Why do we do that? I, it's poor planning on our part, really. And um, this study goes, a, goes a, a pretty long way to suggest that we really need to fix that because they took this, uh, this plastic, this, the microplastics, and they looked to see what these micro, not plastics, but these tire tread plastics rubbers did in estuary ecosystem models and also freshwater ecosystem models. They have a couple of papers that are out. And in the estuary ecosystem paper, they found uh, in their organisms, inland silverside and mycid shrimp, they found that both organisms, after being exposed to the tire tread particles, had significant at, and this is at, concentrations of these tire tread particles that are detected in the environment had significantly altered swimming behaviors, such as increased freezing, changes in positioning, and total distance moved, which the researchers note could lead to an increased risk of predation and challenges for the shrimpy organisms to find food in the wild. They also had reduced growth depending on the level of the exposure to these micro tire particles. And fish exposed to nano tire particles had reduced growth as well. They say leachates affected behavior but did not impact growth in either organism. In the freshwater ecosystem paper, they looked at embryonic zebrafish and the crustacean Daphnia magna, model organisms in the laboratory. And they found in these freshwater organisms, they experienced mortality and developmental abnormalities due to tire particle and leachate exposures. Tire particle leachate was the main driver of toxicity for both organisms and exposure to nano tire particles enhanced toxicity in comparison to leachate alone. So they found the toxicity from tire particles in all these organisms in these different ecosystem models, but sens sensitivity was different between the organisms in the different environments. And so there's yet again, complexity and nuance and some organisms are more sensitive than others. And so that kind of understanding could lead us to develop different risk assessments and policy decisions moving forward. Um, and something that has been happening around my neighborhood over the last few years, the, the researchers mentioned several ways to limit tire particles from entering the environment. And one of them is installing rain gardens. I looked up what rain gardens are, and these are um, 
their areas full of soil and plants that are available for um, in the landscape that collects rain from a roof driveway or a street and allows it to soak into the ground. They're often planted with grasses, flowering perennials, and they can be a cost-effective and beautiful way to reduce runoff from your property. Mm -hmm. And because it's soil, it helps to filter pollutants out in runoff situations. So there's also, if you're using perennials, it's also potentially pollinating insect habitat, songbird habitat, wildlife habitat. There's all sorts of pluses to these rain gardens. Um, Until somebody does a study saying what all the micro pollutants <laughs> are doing to the insects that are getting into the yeah, they're the, getting all the over the yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they end up into the yeah yeah. Just, uh, say, we're terrible for the planet. Why don't we make <laughs> tires out of silicone? I don't. Uh, uh, it doesn't I work on the roads. I don't know. I don't know why we do these things the way we do. Yeah, why do? don't we make them out of steel? That way they'd never wear down. Right. <laughs> but the roads would wear down exactly. and that would be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, there are uh, there are new designs to tires. <laughs> right. I the saw a study steel just... Tires. That would be... <laughs> Still, steel belted tires, right? I just saw a study recently that was talking about new ways to reduce the wear on tires. That uh, the the mix of the tire particulate, the rubber that they use, is uh, it reduces wear by thirty percent to extend the lifespan of the tires. I mean, one of the things you got you got to wonder sometimes in our consumer uh, society, you know. The faster your tires wear out, the faster you buy new yeah. ones, which is sure, sure. great for the businesses, mm -hmm. not so great for I, the environment. I can, tell you, mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, tires aren't changing at all. Mm -hmm. the, 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 no, no, no. The, Maybe over the last two the, years they haven't been. Well, <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, if, uh, I don't know. Uh, if you look at the, what was it, the Firestone Company and all the... You have a small problem with a tire going that's going bad because something is different about it than the other tires. And now you have lawsuits that involve car companies, tire manufacturers, and tire industries. It's one of those things that I don't think can get touched. I, th I have a feeling there's too much legal stuff uh, riding on the on the tires. Riding on? I get it. <laughs> Not changing. Riding on the tires. Well, right now we are riding on the science. Riding on nine. Route 66? No, I don't even know where I'm going with this anymore. Other than to say thank you for being a part of Twist today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your time so that we can share the science with you. We hope that you are enjoying the show. If you are enjoying the show, Please share us with a friend today. All right. We are going to come on right back. This is This Week in Science, and it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And I'm going to What you got, Blair? Oh, I have so many primates today. Do you want to hear about learning primates or sleepy primates first? Primate, primate. Oh, all the primates. Oh, yeah. Just get all of them at once. Okay, all right. All of them at once. Sleepy learning primates. Um, I'll tell you about... Um, my the, my preferred story first so this is about why did you napping. even ask why did you ask it's if you're gonna, gonna tell you both of them either way um you're gonna have to listen to both of them no matter what so sleeping in nature um a lot of people look at animals in nature especially animals that are higher up on the food chain you say they sleep more than humans right they sleep a lot they nap well um a, a long time ago, a study came out, a bunch of studies actually, that identified you can't catch up on sleep. You don't have a sleep bank, right? So like if you miss sleep for a bunch of days in a row, you can't then sleep all day and fix it. 
Similar, you can't sleep all day today and then miss a bunch of sleep for the next three days and be even. But one thing that wait, does, does that happen... Mean, does that mean if I miss a night's sleep that I'm never going to recover from it? It means you... you Forever, so, okay. you're ruined. Because so, at so some this point, is, it's fine. Let so me, I got a problem with that. <laughs> can't recover let me explain it. the difference. There is another theory called sleep homeostasis. And so in that, if you had a bad night's sleep last night, you're going to need a nap today. Hmm. Okay, so like within the, the confines of a singular sleep cycle, a singular circadian rhythm, your body has to catch up to its expectation of sleep, or it should, okay. right? And so you the, the expectation is you see that in animals as well. It's not that if you miss a bunch of sleep a bunch of days in a row, you have really bad sleep a bunch of days in a row, you can then catch up on everything you missed. No, each day pretty much is kind of a clean slate. Um, I think we should call this second one the sleep singularity hypothesis. Yes, sleep <laughs> singularity hypothesis. So then, and so then, so hang on. So then, that would mean yes. that would mean then if I missed two nights of sleep, mm -hmm. uh, on the third night I could get one night of sleep and I'm all caught up. Correct. Oh, yeah, that's that's a much better system. Yes. Then it's not so, that you can't catch up. It's you can't you just pick the one you want. Can. What's right. the evidence, Claire? It's that each day is a new day, basically. Yeah. So, so well, previous studies day, of sleep really, but yeah. have revealed that animals of every species, from honeybees to humans, put aside a portion of their day to rest. A lot of animals nap. With some notable exceptions, all of these sleep studies were in a lab. So you're really missing part of the whole picture. And so this was, as far as these researchers know, the first study ever to examine sleeping behavior in a wild group of primates. So they were able to do this really intense sleep study on primates in the wild, interacting with each other to see if the sleep homeostasis is a real thing. So what they did is they um, collected high resolution movement data from GPS trackers and accelerometers attached to the baboons in uh, almost every single baboon in this troop. And they, um, they found that baboons experience shorter, more fragmented sleep when sleeping near more of their group mates. It's like slumber party syndrome, right? <laughs> up all night however too exciting they also synchronize <laughs> periods of nocturnal awakening with nearby individuals suggesting that baboons might actually be interacting with each other and strengthening their social bonds so they had these collars the accelerometers on they had gps trackers they used cameras they did all sorts of things that were non-invasive to try to figure out what was going on with these animals um and so what they saw was that because these animals were highly gregarious, they were balancing their phys physiological needs for sleep with social pressures of group living. So they, basically what this is saying is um, that even after sleeping poorly, they would spend time on other priorities. Socialization, number one, for sure. Looking out for predators. These things are more important than catching up on lost sleep, than napping or sleeping during the night, right? And so um, this kind of calls into question a lot of previous sleep research on animals because it, it was kind of done in a vacuum. It, and a lot of previous sleep research also involved more, more invasive methods. And so if you had to um, use something where, for example, you needed to drill into their skull to look at their brain or anything like that, that is going to impact your ability to have them in a space with other individuals, which then is going to impact how they actually respond to these things. So basically what these, re these studies are showing, sure, in a vacuum with no other stressors, if they got a bad night's sleep the night before, they will sleep more during the day. But if you put in all of the normal stuff that goes with being an animal in the wild, sleep is not number one on the list. And so th this is looking at this idea that humans are kind of individual or unusual in the fact that we push sleep for other priorities, 
we have to go to work. We can't just nap in the middle of the day, or at least, you know, I can. I don't know about other people who are watching or listening, but <laughs> they're competing I think priorities. The pandemic allowed a lot more people to nap in the middle of the day and do their yeah. work at different schedules. <laughs> For sure. Um, but yes, there are these competing priorities that have us uh, accumulate what you might call a sleep debt, although, you know, for what it's worth, that may or may not exist, depending on what kind of debt you're talking about, and that this might be somehow unique to modern industrialized societies. But looking at what they're seeing here in these baboons, it looks like this actually has a much deeper evolutionary root of being able to kind of weigh costs of missing out versus um, sleeping. So, so if you sleep and you miss important social interactions or you're not there to alert the group to a predator or you miss out some grazing opportunity or whatever it is, there, the cost actually outweighs the benefit in a lot of cases. And so you'd be better off to be tired, but to be able to get all this other stuff. So you could also look at this like uh, FOMO in the wild, I suppose. That's what I was going to say. I mean, this, this sounds like these primates or are we talking about teenagers or freshmen in college? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. What are you choosing? Are you going to sleep? Are you going to stay up and study with your friends? Are you going to go to that party? What are the more important things to do right now? Yeah. Well, I would argue it would be the studying one, but the teenager might argue it is the party. Um, you know what? Maybe right. they're right. Maybe I'm not right. Maybe the social interaction is more important. Who's to say? I mean, baboons would probably agree with the teenager in that case. The social interaction is the most important thing. Are you, but anyway. Did you just call all teenagers baboons? Because I no. kind of agree with you. <laughs> no. I kind of agree with no. you. No, they I are, didn't. They, they do operate very much like a baboon troop. No, no. A teenager. No. I mean, uh, oh boy. Tina Boone. Oh Never no. Um, well, anyway, so so yes, yeah, so this is something that the first study of its kind identified the need to do sleep studies in the wild, but also identified a new methodology that is less invasive, accelerometry-based methods yeah. that are easy, they're cheap. They could be integrated into other studies that are used tracking animals and natural habitats. And then you can expand this sleep study across a huge range of species. And so this could also potentially be applied to humans. <laughs> and so there's lots of different things that you could do to kind of figure out what's going on here. But I want to see them apply these collars to magpies. Oh, yeah, they'll pull them right off. I thought right you were going to say exactly. humans, and I was going to say we. Most of us we have already, them already. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Our our smart watches, our cell, our smartphones. There are sleep trackers. You can stick little pads in your bed to track your sleep if you want. There's all sorts of devices these days. Yeah. If you, um, but I, but I, I. The one thing I really love about this, it's even though it's a small study, kind of proof of concept. Yes. Yeah. It's. It's interesting in that it kind of upends a lot of ideas about the importance of sleep. But at the same time, it also, yeah, I think, you know, we, we so much recently, we talk a lot on the show about the importance of sleep. And, oh, if you don't get all the right sleep, your metabolism is going to be messed up. And that's, an, that's a problem. And you're going to die young and bad mm -hmm. metabolic disease and all this kind of stuff. But Maybe we can relax just a little bit. Yeah. Or or maybe we can find a way to be more relaxed Balance. with our schedules a little bit when yeah. it's available. I think that's the other yes, problem, right? Is that part. we are in this very strict day. The baboons don't have this strict day. They don't have to be at work at 9 a.m. no matter what. Yep. If they if things are chill, if everyone else is asleep, nothing interesting is going on, they can snooze. And that's the difference, right? Is that they can adapt to the need of their environment, but we have these very rigid structured days that, so basically the study is saying it's not unusual for animals to forego naps like we often have to do as adults. Yeah. But I, I would argue what is unusual is that we're not allowed to nap when it would be okay to nap. <laughs> Like if you're having a slow day at work, you know, there's no emails coming in. I finished my projects early. I'm taking, taking a nap. nap. <laughs> I mean, some tech it's... companies allow that. I'm pretty sure they have, they have nap rooms, but. But we don't have. Yeah, a nap but they room. also have, they also have 18 hour days. <laughs> yeah, that's also true. Yeah. So there's yeah, no twist that. nap room though, Blair. No. No. Next story. Next Come on. story. Right so, now. So this story, I bring 
less for the results and more for the experiment design because it's very strange. So this is a study from Central European University and um, uh, sorry, Central European University's Department of Cognitive Science, but also Utves Lorand University, the University of St. Andrews and Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. So this is a, a, a very uh, collaborative study. They wanted to know about how apes and other primates learn. Specifically, if they want to be taught. Because there are different ways to learn. So one way would be to observe someone doing something and then copy them. This is how we observe a lot of animals learning. Observation. This is faster than discovering it on your own. Their example in the, in the, in the article is... In case of a baby, randomly pushing buttons of the toy to see what happens, right? So just experimentation. But uh, the best way to learn, most of us would argue, is when someone can teach you. They can say how to do something, why it works, and what doesn't work. And so the question is, do apes and other primates like to be taught? Ch human children show a preference to learn through what they call communication. That's not surprising. That's how our whole society is based, right? Is on teaching mm -hmm. our children things. Primatologists have recorded several cases regarding the ability of great apes to learn from observing others. But what apes lack, or at least what current research implies apes lack, is intentional teaching. Hmm. What they've seen is juveniles will learn from their mother how to use a wooden stick for a termite fishing situation just by watching her. But they say we have not seen mothers try to call attention to the juvenile to the most important parts of the actions. Like, look here, I'm going to do this this way because X, Y, Z. So do apes care about the being taught or not? So right off the bat, I would say just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean they're not doing it. But I will shelve that right. for the yeah. remainder of this. <laughs> so in the study, this is their attempt to try to identify whether primates had a preference to be communicated with while they learned versus just observing and copying something. So this is a ride. So stick with me. So they showed chimpanzees, bonobos, and orangutans how to operate a food dispenser device. In order to get the food, they had to insert an object into a small hole on top of the device. After they inserted it, it gave a sound and a food pellet was dispensed. That is, if they put the right object in. Hmm, okay. There were also wrong objects provided, which if that happened, then just nothing happened. They didn't get a sound. They didn't get a treat. So it has to be right object, right, right port. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you're learning multiple aspects of the, the situation. Right. And so then they had researchers show the apes how to use it. They had two kinds of demonstrations. You can see where this is going. They had a teaching and a not teaching, right? So while one demonstrator was communicating with the ape, they would insert objects. So they would make eye contact. They'd clap their hands. They told the ape, hello. They kind of mimed like they were teaching. The other demonstrator did not communicate. They only made some attention grabbing sounds. They knocked on the floor just so the ape was looking in the right direction, but otherwise did not communicate, did not make eye contact, just went about their business. <laughs> and... <laughs> Um, and so they had these very different procedures. Now, what I was trying to figure out is they didn't, these two individuals doing this in different ways, didn't do the same thing with the objects. The demonstrator who was communicating only used wrong objects. The demonstrator who was not communicating only used correct objects. Why would you change this variable? And I think this is why. Because if you did right objects with both of them or wrong ob objects with both of them, you would be unable to separate out the difference between the two and they yeah. could just be copying. Otherwise, yes. there's no there's no way to separate out the variable of communication. Yeah. So they they sep they did these two different objectives so that they could see. And this is what they saw. That the, that the apes who watched the communicator, the teacher, put wrong objects more in more. So they paid more attention to what the 
their teacher work. was doing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, oh, it didn't work. It didn't work. I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. So, so, okay. So actually it's, they actually continued to put the wrong objects in, even though they could see with their own eyes that the wrong objects never made food. They still chose those objects often. Hmm. So, so they did just copy. They did, so, but they copied the communicator more. Yeah. So that is what's happening here is that they paid more attention to the person who was talking to them, even though it didn't get them their desired result. In control groups, when either both demonstrators were communicating or none of them were communicating, but one was still using the wrong objects, the other one's still using the right objects, the majority of them did not have a problem choosing the right objects. They were able to do it and get the treats. So they really, this is super confusing, but they actually did a pretty good job of experiment design to try to separate out these variables in a situation where we don't speak the same language, we don't know how they communicate fully with each other. We can't do that with them, but we could we could figure out a way to kind of parse out these different pieces of the experiment. So yeah. as opposed to the control, they copied the communicator, the teacher more, which means they paid more attention to what they were doing. So they are sensitive to communication cues and they can recognize them and react to them. So in the case of children, the assumption is that there's language involved, right? You, they're yeah. learning the language. They are cued into you. Look, this is how you should do it. <laughs> it would be a tough kind of leap to go straight there with these apes after this one study. But it does look like, at the very least, they... they Give, they pay more mind to someone who is connected to them, who is making eye contact and talking to them. So the hope here is that this is a starting point. There will be further research to help understand what could be kind of the missing piece to, to make this true education, I guess, or teaching opportunities between humans and apes, but also between apes and apes. Because also, this is the other funny thing, yeah. is that in this study, they say um, that apes do not teach each other in the wild. And I have a really hard time believing that. <laughs> Because then the do. discovery, yeah. the it's, discovery is that that, that but it, it, now it's not that they don't learn from each other. It's that apes could be better teachers. <laughs> they could be they could, better. They could sure. be better <laughs> teachers than they. I are. mean, what they're doing is modeling behavior just by doing it. They're not right. sitting their their baby baby apes down and saying, "Now you sit here, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you what you need to learn." Like, there's no deficit. When I was model a lad. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so they're not and they do communicate with their child their offspring and with others but it it just happens along the way it's not as mm -hmm. so focused as we are as humans yeah you yeah, don't have but... to get them to put down the phone sit still <laughs> and eyes forward to teach them something it's well and, and it's education modeling you know. behavior that works education best practices now are not doing that. It's moving yeah. more towards the way the apes are learning. It's moving more towards learning by doing and experimentation mm -hmm. and yep. um, experiment first theory later, as yeah. opposed to, you know, how all of we were raised, which is the uh, sit Read down, the listen to this lecture and then put your yeah. hot dog in this solar cooker. It's, you know, it's. Yeah. Or that, and that's an old system. Don't put your that's, hot dog uh, in the solar cooker. It's never going to cook all the way. It does. It takes all day. It's but, all day. but that's, you know, that's in, John in this theory. That's John Dewey, by the way. John Dewey in started. Portland, this it doesn't even work. Yeah, I know. In, in the, uh, sunny San Francisco and the sunset, it did not cook at all when I was growing up. But yeah, but the idea don't, is. Don't, it don't should... even have a solar cooker in San Francisco. What is it? It was a crazy place to be. The, the theory now would be. <laughs> Send the kids out and do that and then say, why yeah. did this work? Why didn't it work? And then learn together about all of the theories behind it, right? Yeah. Um, and so, I, yes. So I think, I think to say apes, quote unquote, don't teach each other in the wild is silly. I'm so yeah. sorry. You did all this research with apes. 
I don't buy that. Um, <laughs> I like the research yeah. that you did. They 100% teach each other in the wild. Um, the way that they do it, maybe you're not defining that as education or teaching. I think it is. But it would be great to be able to observe different kind of copying behaviors in apes and say, okay, in this one, they made eye contact with each other. They groomed each yes. other before or afterwards. Yes. In this other situation, they didn't do those things and they didn't carry on the information the same way, right? So we need to figure out how to analogize what the study is looking at into how apes actually communicate with each other. Which we still don't know. No. So yeah, that if we, we can't say that they don't though. teach each other if yeah. we don't really understand their full modes of communication. Yep. By the way, this uh, education uh, system of doing instead of the rote learning of memorizing lists of things was developed by John Dewey in the early 1900s, who became America's first education czar and changed the way classrooms taught subjects for a really long time. And then at some point we were like, oh, but we have to pass a test. So we started right. teaching people to remember information to then regurgitate onto a test. And, and kind of ruin the thing. It's nice to hear that we're uh, heading back in the John Dewey direction. We're heading back in the direction of the apes who came up with it first. <laughs> Didn't work. Justin, tell me some science news. Oh, you want, oh, you wanted science news. Oh gosh. Let me see if I've yeah, got any yeah. of that left. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you got it. University of Copenhagen and Aarhus University looked at the spread of misinformation on the Twitter University. Uh, so they were looking at uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, face mask related Twitter activity between February to November of 2020. And they were focused on the acceptance or spread of rejection of misinformation on Twitter during the first wave, uh, big wave of coronavirus pandemic in Denmark. Misinformation, they say, accounted for a small portion of the overall fa face mask related tweets. Very small percentage, uh, with almost equal number of misinformation spreaders and rejectors. So in the early part of the pandemic, tiny little bit of people who were like, ah, face masks uh, make you inhale too much of your own exhale, and that will cause brain damage. And then they had the same amount of people like, ah, you're that's nonsense, right? By the end, though. In the, first, the number of tweets rejecting misinformation exceeded the tweets spreading the misinformation. Over time, however, the tweets spreading misinformation outnumbered those rejecting it. So the, the misinformation grew during the pandemic. Most cases, tweets rejecting misinformation did not engage with substantive claims, but instead ridiculed the misinformation spreaders. Uh, analysis suggests that future initiatives to limit online misinformation should consider also status-seeking dynamics about, uh, amongst both the misinformation spreaders and the prominent misinformation rejectors. So they're saying the focus seems to be people speaking to their own audience and not actually engaged in a dialogue. 33% of all tweets rejecting misinformation used satire, irony, and humor. Well, uh, that was only true of 8% of tweets spreading misinformation. So that kind of tracks. So that having a sense of snarky sense of humor, I think tends to track more with people who are fact-based. I think the other problem is that, is, that, is that we've been told for years now that conspiracy theorists don't care if you give them facts. But I think yeah. that's the problem yeah. is that you might not be, you might not be swaying them, but it's about the other people reading it. It's no, it's well, about, and it, and it, it might it, be them. Because no, that's no, it. it's not. It's not. in. I mean, it's the response because I think what Justin said is exactly right. Is it's people playing to their own audience. Mm -hmm. You're trying to impress people who think like you. Oh, other people might be that that think like me might see what I write and I want to impress them. Yeah. You're not actually the people who are rejecting misinformation, dialogue. rebutting misinformation are not trying to have dialogue. 
They're not trying yeah. to actually have a conversation. And that's the, yeah. that's the problem. It's because and we're was, all you know, putting it, ourselves on stage. Yeah. And it wasn't Sorry, all, but it was, it was a big, it was a yeah, big percentage of those re- rejecting misinformation were basically just uh, making fun of the people, mm-hmm. which, which I kind of get. Like, uh, I kind of get that. Like that was my first makes response me, at this point. It makes me feel a little better sometimes. <laughs> I hope that doesn't make me a bad yeah. person. Yeah. <laughs> it, no, no, it, it doesn't. Does, Blair, it doesn't. Totally. I, I'm not the so, one but making this is fun a, of them. This is a problem. But it's when someone else, you know, posts a conspiracy theory and, and I just, I get to see the one little comment where I'm like, yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but then again, that's who they're doing it for is for you. Says Professor Rebecca mm-hmm. Alder Nissen, one of the researchers behind the study. We tend to believe that people... Eager to correct misinformation will be very fact-oriented. But Mm -hmm. our study shows that this group of people typically choose to ridicule those spreading misinformation. Mm -hmm. Instead of bridging gaps or inviting people to change their minds by updating their knowledge, their response to misinformation takes the form of know-it-all remarks intended to patronize, uh, patronize their opponent and praise themselves. Consequently, the research has gloomed a lot of people who either spread or reject misinformation or are really trying to defend their own social position. Yeah. But uh, at some point though, at some point though, as the, as the number of this misinformation grew, gosh, it's, it just gets hard to like point out facts, doesn't it? Like, wow. Yep. Yeah. Well, you try all yeah, the analogies, you... you try all the, Things and sometimes, and, while, and like, sometimes oh. you get tired, <laughs> just tired of saying the same things over and over again. Um, also, you know, and, yeah, yeah. And if people yeah. won't listen to your to the facts because they have a different set of facts because they are stuck in different chambers of information, and your information doesn't overlay with their information then nothing you say is potentially going to be right. Because what you're doing is you're battling misinformation with an attack of information as opposed to trying to be compassionate and find out, you know, and hit and, 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 and at least compose your comment with respect to their emotions, to where they're coming from, actually having a dialogue as opposed to just spewing facts. I mean, every, yeah. all of us, we can all bar facts all day long. Yeah, but see, then it's... But Nobody then wants it's, those. But you're actually, in a weird way, you're making an argument that is potentially against giving those facts. Because no, I'm then not. All, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm not, here, I'm not here, arguing that at all. I know you're not arguing that, but here's, yes. here's the argument I can hear uh, evolve from that, which is that we should just then stop giving equal time to the debates. Because then it's like, Here's why global warming is not happening. And then, uh, we, like, we have to give them the same amount of time as the IPCC. Like, no. No, you don't. You can cut to the quick and be like, you're a, a Russian fossil fuel industry lobbyist troll or just a moron. I don't know which. But it, it's fine. And then just be sure. done with it. It just depends. Because at what... some point, you got to stop giving equal time. Oh, absolutely. But it depends on what what you're talking about right now is Twitter. And Twitter is a different beast than a real debate or real news coverage. (laughs) Like Twitter is that. I mean, and you go into Twitter and you're going to decide your communication goal. Are you trying to change somebody's mind or are you tired and you just want to tweet angrily at people? Do you want to just be reactive or do you want to be thoughtful? These are, you know, individual choices. And that what I'm seeing from this study that's really important is that a lot of times on these social media platforms, we're not being thoughtful. We're trying we're to talking. play. We're not talking. Yeah. We're playing to our audience because what do we want? Yeah. More followers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately where both of you or- could meet in this conversation is give facts have a conversation with a conversational tone or leave it. Yeah. (laughs) I think that's the point, right? Is that if you are, if you are talking down at reprimanding, 
um, patronizing these individuals, then that's not actually helping other people seeing that tweet. And you just look like a jerk. And then, <laughs> and not to mention that boosts the, the whole thing about Twitter, right? Is that boosts the tweet. Yeah. The more interactions well, it gets, the more people it, see it. So if you actually, see a tweet that's nonsense and you don't want to spend the time to debunk it properly, maybe leave it. I do and, that and, all and the I, time. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I write out half a tweet and then I go, oh gosh, what am I doing? Yeah. This is, the, no, delete, yeah. delete, delete. Yeah. And I take a breath and I put Twitter away and I walk away. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And Arn Lore brings a really good point up in the chat room, which is that often people spreading misinformation don't follow the rules that I just said. So even if we follow those rules, then mm -hmm. uh, the misinformers will not and it still causes a problem. And then that's why we still do need to fight back with facts. Well, chances <laughs> are, we chances are you can just ignore them because if we're sticking with Twitter after a while, you might not even hear from them anymore. This is uh, researchers at the Technical University of Denmark, DTU. They analyzed 60 billion tweets. Boy, that's a lot of reading. Oh, they used a uh, computer deep thinking stuff to, to look at it, do the analysis. Looked at 60 billion tweets. This was, uh, they looked at vaccine hesitancy before the pandemic took place. This is this is before the the vaccines were you know in the news. The the COVID nineteen vaccines were even a thing. Uh, they found that misinformation on social media contributes to distrust as well as a fa as false beliefs in both the benefits and disadvantages of vaccines. Looking at the links people use to support their tweets, they found the pro vaccine crowd often posted links to news media, science sites as reference for their opinion, support for their opinion. When the anti-vax crowd links were there, they tended to be YouTube videos and conspiracy theory websites. This is according to uh, Bjarke Monsa DTU. Additionally, they found that the anti-vax protest uh, posters, anti-vax posters, profiles themselves often linked to commercial sites that were selling alternative health products. Previous research had shown that globally, there are about 12 people responsible for the majority of vaccine misinformation and that they are part of alternative health product industry. This is before the pandemic. So you're sort of also like, there's, there's the, this is the dark underside of communication is, who's not knowing who you're communicating with, sometimes you miss that they have a specific agenda and it doesn't matter what your argument's going to be. Uh, Anti-vaxxers and pro-vaxxers, they found, do not talk to each other. Research confirms echo chamber effect, making it hard for vaccine advocates and opponents to encounter each other's views on the internet because the way social media algorithms work, people interact with others whose opinions align with their own. That's why we're speaking to our audience all the time, like that the last study was talking about, it's because that's who we end up surrounded with. And then and then something like a vaccine or masks comes up that wasn't part of the Venn diagram before. And then that's the little bit of conflict that you can have and it can seem extreme because everybody should be thinking like me because everybody on social media says the things that I'm saying. It's that echo chamber. Because uh, the way social media algorithms work, people interact with those whose opinions align with their own, which I actually think is great. I wouldn't want it any other way because uh, I have very low tolerance for uh, stupid people at this point. <laughs> I'm just done. <laughs> done. done with it. And, it. and it may mean that uh, Carol in HR uh, thinks the vaccine her cat got uh, made it uh, socially unreceptive towards her. But... <laughs> But it's too bad. I'm not going to, I don't care to share social media circles with bad information anymore. It's too, too annoying. Uh, but they say that the more resistance to vaccines a user expressed, the further from the norm was the media picture they were exposed to from their circle of friends, according to the study. 
Research uh, covers the period before COVID-19, and they say there's no doubt that vaccines have become a talking point in a, in a whole new way over the last few years. Vaccines have gone from being a topic that was primarily discussed amongst particular population groups to becoming markedly more mainstream. So they're, uh, they're sort of interested in looking at this again. This was, uh, this, just to take you back into, this is, the 60 billion tweets were, were from uh, 2013 to 2016. Vaccine supporters uh, made up 45% of the data that they used. Vaccine opponents made up only 3% of their data. Huh. Yeah. So it seems like somebody's been gaining ground, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, I mean, the vax, yeah. the anti-vax thing definitely was not a as much of, it wasn't really a political thing before. It was, but it wasn't it was, as as identity focused. It You're was, right. I feel yeah, like it was it way more identified as part of the um the 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 crunchy health crowd than yeah. with uh oh, than with the you. far yeah. right. So, so that's what you would hear yeah, about. That's yeah. what you would hear about in California, especially living in the you know, the the uh the Bay Area and your surrounding areas. That's that little sliver of the people isn't the biggest portion of that. Um, there's a big, there's always been a big religious right and right wing anti medicine grifter supplement industry mm. has been going on for a long time. So the difference is, it's not that the anti vax, uh, here's, the, here's the thing it's always been a grifter thing, not a political thing. Until yeah. a grifter thing and the political thing became the same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Yep. I'm super excited. So you mentioned the uh, research that was done to determine the 12 individuals who are responsible for the majority of anti-vax information um, yeah. on Twitter. And the conference for science communicators that I'm involved in, Science Talk, which is happening at the end of March, the 24th, 25th of March, our, one of our keynote speakers on the second day is Imran Ahmed, and he is the CEO for the Center for Countering Digital Hate, which did that work. Oh. So I'm excited to I'm excited to hear him speak about very neat about that work. He's coming to Portland, so I'm hoping I get to meet him and talk about countering digital hate and misinformation. I'm very excited. Very cool. Yeah. Science Talk 22 for science communicators nice. like you. This is This Week in Science. We don't hate. We just enjoy science. We do. We like the science. Mm -hmm. If you are enjoying the show, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link and help support this show in an ongoing fashion. If you sponsor us at $10 or more per month, just per, just per month, it's a fairly doable amount, we'll thank you by name at the end of the show. There's a lot more in rewards there as well. Thank you for your support of Twist. We really can't do this without you. I'm going to come on back with a few more stories to finish out our tight 90. Okay, mm. let's <laughs> let's jump into the brain. Mm -hmm. Blah 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 blah. Um this study published this week in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is very exciting to me. It's uh researchers out of Carl Illinois College of Medicine at the University of Illinois. Researchers uh, worked on this multidisciplinary project to develop a way to visualize epigenetic markers in the DNA of your brain. So you know how an MRI usually uh, responds to the changes in oxygenation or the vibration of molecules, atoms within your brain, the, the spins of protons. And you can get in, the, the researchers can get a picture of activation in the brain, of blood flow in the brain, of things that are happening energetically in the brain. Well, they used previous research to, uh, that, that showed that 
a marker known as carbon-13 can be imaged in the brain. And carbon-13 could be used if it was given in the diet to a person. In this case, it was pigs, but could be given in the diet as a way to mark methyl groups, which are involve carbon, um, these methyl groups that are needed for DNA methylation. And so what happens when you experience something? There are a lot of changes that take place within the molecules that are inside your brain. Not only do your neurons send their action potentials all over the place to signal with each other, the neurons themselves are also computing what's happening. And there are changes to the DNA that will change the way that the DNA responds the next time you have a similar experience. It's part of the learning process. And the DNA methylation is a methyl, it's a methyl group, this molecular group that it gets attached to the DNA to kind of wrap it up. And where the wrapping happens, it changes the way that translation and transcription of the DNA can occur. Translation and transcription is necessary for the production of proteins, which allow processes to take place in the neurons that allow behaviors to occur. So they used baby pigs in the first few weeks of their lives. They were fed with carbon-13 labeled methionine. And then as the, the pigs grew, without having to sacrifice the animals, they could put them in these what they're calling eMRI machines for epigenetic MRI. Um, they're able to image these epigenetic changes as the pigs developed, experienced, learned, and grew. Cool thing. I'm so excited about this this technology. Yeah. Being able to actually image molecular changes within the brain. That is wild. But you have to be on the carbon-13 diet from a <laughs> young pig lady age for this to work. Right. But I mean, it would be it, it would be the kind of thing where if we wanted to do human studies with the uh, carbon-13, methionine, this is something we could have in our diets. It's not uh, it's an amino acid. It's an essential amino acid. So it's not a problem. And instead of using carbon-12, which is very common, you just re you use a form of methionine that has mm -hmm. this isotope that's a little bit different, carbon-13, that can be read a little bit differently. And so we could potentially use this technology if it, uh, as they develop it further to see how the brain changes in response to certain experiences. So you could imagine like uh, psychological exper experiments where different groups have different, different experiences. Watch a movie that's uh, shocking or watch a movie that's calming and see if there are changes after having a particular experience. Um, yeah, you can imagine the work that you could do there. Very cool. <sighs> On pigs. On pigs, or, so far. Or apes. Yeah. I mean, it's like almost humans. Aren't we just long pigs? Yeah. Mm, pretty right. much. <laughs> pretty much. Long anyway, new technology. Thing. Yeah. New technology imaging epigenetic changes to DNA in the brain. Pictures, changes to DNA. In the, it's just. That's wild. Yeah. It's kind of kind of blowing my mind a little bit. Um, and then from the NIH, this came in very, very last minute that I was very thrilled about. Uh, researchers at the National Eye Institute have been looking at uh, organelles within the eye's photoreceptors. These little organelles you might recognize the name of mitochondria. Oh, that's what the, the energy center there. It's all the, you got the, in the yeah. genes there. They're, they're, Powerhouse yeah. of the cell. Powerhouse of the Chromo cell, energy center. Yeah. yeah, yeah, mitochondria. They're very, they're good. All cells have them, or they should. It's very good for our cells. Anyway, this study found an entirely new purpose for mitochondria in the eye's photoreceptors. Uh, these organelles 
they're not just there for energy production for these photoreceptors. They also are stacked in a way that has an optical effect. So what they've discovered using just a microscope, modified microscope, they observed the optical properties of living cone cell mitochondria that were exposed to light. And they found that the mitochondria focused, concentrated the transmission of the light from the inner to the outer segments of the cone photoreceptors and thus act as focusing elements within the photoreceptors of the eye. Wow. So they used to just be like, oh, why do they have like, oh, the eye photoreceptors must use a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Why are they stacked in that way? What's going on? Oh, look, they actually have a function. In focus. You had one job. Oh no, actually, you've got more than mm -hmm. one. Oh wow. My new country is leave some jobs for the rest of them. <laughs> nah, I'm gonna do them all. I it's... could be mitochondria. Mitochondria is. So if if multicellular organisms didn't indeed come from single-celled organisms getting eaten by each other, then I'm I'm surprised. <sighs> I'm surprised that that we haven't found more organelles that do a bunch of different kind of disparate things because I think we also just kind of go, oh, we found your function. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and it's like, that's great. Thanks. We, good here's job. The, yeah. We here's the job. label. Yeah. You're in the box. You have your own box there. We love our boxes. Oh, what if I got something else? No, no, no. I've already labeled that box. I got to move on. It's a lot of boxes. Yeah. Yeah, but if if they are. if organelles really did come from engulfed single-celled organisms, it sure would make sense for more of them to do multiple things. They, it, yeah. I understand that over time, it makes sense to streamline the work and do all this kind of stuff. But but for it to all kind of go away and have it just have a very one clear rule, for it just seems like it wouldn't always happen. Yeah, one thing that I thought was very interesting, uh, just from this, they uh, in this story, um, just based on this research, they realizing that the mitochondria have this function. They uh, compared it to other animals, and it does give, like you're talking about, like okay, what are the other functions of different organelles and things? Um, it has been discovered also that there are photoreceptors of birds and reptiles that contain oil droplets and the oil droplets in the inner segments of the uh, of the eye serve an optical role that might be similar to this mitochondrial micro lens function. Hmm. Yeah. So perhaps there were these oil droplets and then the oil droplets got replaced. I don't know. There's very a lot of ideas. Uh, the researchers say this insight conceptually bridges compound eyes in arthropods with the camera eyes of vertebrates, two independently evolved image forming systems, demonstrating the power of convergent evolution. Mm -hmm. power. Very good. power of convergence and science and <sighs> mitochondria are so cool. Oh, and by the way, I just want to finish this up with two quick stories of science working the way that it's supposed to work. No good. more brains. We're going to space, everybody. Okay. This week, Friday, there's a rocket that's supposed to impact the moon. We reported previously, I reported previously, that it was SpaceX. Well, researchers looking at the trajectories of various bits of space junk from different launches think that it's not SpaceX booster, a SpaceX booster from a Falcon 9 that's going to hit the moon, the far side of the moon. It's going to be a Chinese booster that is uh, from a uh, from the the Chang the Changi. Changi 5T1 mission in 2014. Although the Chinese deny this is theirs. The rocket is the, going to hit what? I was what? just like, we got too much space junk up there. We can't even figure out so yeah, who's it is. Hit the moon. Oh, you put that one up there? I don't know. Is that one of mine? I can't tell. I I'm can't not cleaning it up. It's junk not mine, mom. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, why it's are going they denying to... it? Why would they deny it? Like, what's what's it they're going to get some moon damage liability issues? 
coming up in the future. Oh, you hit the moon, you owe us. Who do you pay? Who do you try? What would be the, who cares? I don't know. The I rocket's know. going to impact into Hertzsprung Crater on the far side of the moon at 7.25 a.m. approximately Eastern Standard Time on Friday, March 4th. We won't be able to see it because it's on the far side of the moon, but uh, we know the trajectory. And But we don't really know whether it's like spinning or whether it's going end over end. We don't know exactly what's happening with how it's spinning toward the moon. So we don't know how it's going to impact, but we have a good idea. And then we're going to send our lunar orbiter around to take a look at it hmm. and finish up observations and look at the atmosphere of the moon to see what shot into space surrounding the moon once how the impact long, happened. How long will it take the, the, the little lunar buddy to get over there? Do you think, Do you think we'll no, find out the same day? I don't think that we're going to find out the same day. Okay. No, right. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly when the lunar the lunar orbiter is going to be there to take a look. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I'm not the the sooner the better, but I'm not sure yes. they're going to do what they can. Um and then in other, oh hey, science is doing what it's supposed to kind of news. Uh there was a report in 2020 from the European Southern Observatory uh that there's this black hole that's a thousand light years away from us it's the closest black hole to us and it's, wow this is amazing it's super close hr 6819 solar system and uh, there were some papers but then uh there was some con contestation they contested contestation i just made up that, that word a, i like that word <laughs> this is a contestation uh, some Belgian researchers said, hold on a second, what's going on? And uh, so they they came up with some new hypotheses as to what was going on. They got some new data from the very big and the very large Terra telescope. And they were able to, this, with this data, have finer resolution to be able to determine that it is not actually a black hole. What it is, in fact, is a vampire. What? A vampire binary system. It's two oh. stars orbiting each other. One star has ripped all of the star stuff away from the other star, and they're just spiraling. They're in a death spiral, but it's not a black hole. So no black hole a thousand light years away from us. Thank you, science. We needed to know this. There might be others. We just haven't found them yet. But this is the way science works. Someone puts out a result. Someone says, I don't think so. Someone else says, okay, let's look at more data. And then the experiments are done and you get to a more accurate answer. And they collaborated. They didn't fight each other for these papers. The two teams came together and published this final paper together. So this is science at work thank you science for bringing us the knowledge did we bring the knowledge we do it we did. did we do it yeah I think we did i think we did blair blair's been yawning for a while so i think we stop it why you gotta tell the podcast past, listeners about it the 90 minutes I've been yawning since I woke up this morning. So, okay. Yeah, why are you going to put me on blast, Justin? It's so rude. Maybe I had too much processed meat. That's not what happened. We'll see. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for being here for another wonderful episode of This Week in Science. We really do enjoy having you here. It's time for some shout outs. Thank you, too. Fada, thank you so much for our, all your help on show notes and show descriptions and on social media. Our chat rooms. Thank you, chatters, for being here during the show and chatting and letting us know what you think all the way through. Identity 4, thank you for recording the show. 
Gord and Arn Lore and others who keep the chat room safe places. Thank you for keeping them safe places. And Rachel, thank you for your assistance and for your editing. And now publishing, getting closer to publishing, more duties. We love it. And finally, thank you. Thank you, as always, to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, too. Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Radiswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Woody, uh, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Bigard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Matty Perrin, Gorov Sharma, Reagan, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Skylake, Carl Ronovich, Kevin Bearden, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenpo, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard Brendan Minish, Johnny Ridley, rock me day, flying out. Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Bob Coburn, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Deposu, Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luth, and Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D., Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, and Jason Roberts. Thank you. Thank you all for your support of Twists on Patreon, please head over to twist.org and click the Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time or Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European time. Broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you bake some mealworm cookies? Just search for This Week in Science if our podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for a newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will end up in my mealworm cookie batter. It will get baked into cookies. I will eat it, and we will never read it. Yum, yum, yum. (laughs) Yeah, you can also be a part of the audience as we ridicule unscientific people on Twitter. (laughs) <laughs> Where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes during the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand. I don't represent philosophy and... <laughs> It's the after show. Thank you all for joining us for another wonderful episode. I hope you learned some fun, sciencey, newsy things. 
I hope you had fun interacting with other science people. I hope we all had a very nice evening. Thank you, all of you. Pink Floyd Lunar Base. Yes, hmm. it's full of tardigrades. Well, I wonder, wonder, ooh, that's a great point, Fada. I wonder if uh, the Chinese have a probe on the far side of the moon, depending on the location, compared to where it's going to impact. Was it planned? Should we pay attention? I don't, I don't know. I think this is an yeah. example of space junk gone too far. I do. Ah, oh, Kevin B. Kev B. Artemis 1 pushed back to May. Orbit moon coming back for splashdown unmanned. We'll see if that happens. I'm not optimistic about any of it because mm. they just talked about how money, much money old Artemis is going to cost us and nobody wants to pay it. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say billions of dollars a year. And our, you know, the politicians are like, well, maybe we should spend that money on war instead of going to space. <sighs> Fada has a question for you. Oh, I saw this earlier. Okay. Um, so this is a tough question. So the question from Fada is, uh, we've taught certain apes sign language to communicate with them. Have we asked those apes with ASL to teach us how they communicate with each other? So yeah. unfortunately, I don't really think we've taught apes how to communicate with sign language it's like very similar to baby sign so like they can say if they want things they can answer questions with one word answers or a few words of an answer okay. but it's really not it's it's not like they could you if you ask them an abstract question like that they're not going to sit there and sign for five minutes and explain how apes communicate like that is that is a really abstract thing and the way that they've been taught sign language is very superficial. Also, only like three or four apes have ever been like taught sign language beyond what's this called? It's called this sort of thing. Um, and even those, that was not scientific. It was not reported on scientifically. Yeah. And so there's actually a lot of questions around the methodology and the yeah. results in those cases a lot of them are circumstantial it's a nice story oh there's but there's back. there's not very much scientific about it if i am being honest and i am sorry to tell everyone that but um the there's questionable practices around the facilities where these apes were and they were not very scientific in the way they did things. And it's just, yeah. It, to say that apes could communicate with sign language, it's not like in the movies where they're just chatting at you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't think you could ask them that question. Having philosophical, philosophical conversations mm -hmm. with, a, with a baboon. So, and this is the thing. I think uh, my threshold... Uh, for alien intelligence, I, I should probably apply... To Earthlings of all uh, yeah. species, yeah, sense of humor. And until you can tell a joke, I don't really find you to be intelligent. Now, there have been, there is, there is chimp humor. Yeah, uh, uh, mm -hmm. chimp. Uh, there's uh, in, in interactions uh, that I, there's an interaction that specifically one that I have in my head of of a chimp. Uh, uh, mother chimpanzee mother putting something i think a, a food something down for an infant who was checking it out who then looked away and then the mother removed it and the child looked at it for it again and couldn't find it and the chimp mother grinned so there's are there are some examples of uh, maybe some some humor in the chimpanzee families so i might i might well you have to be you have to be little... 
You should be careful with not, grinning, though, because yeah, that, that, yeah, that doesn't the, always mean the same thing. It was the happy. It was the happy okay. one. It okay. was that researchers were talking about. Okay. This is the first example. Like, we covered this. I covered this on Twist, I think, at some point uh, a bazillion years ago. But uh, so there's some examples of that. But really, it has to be uh, have humor for it to be intelligent, which is also why I found the, the lack of humor in the anti maskers. Uh, <laughs> the correlation that they found between the use of humor and being uh, pro or anti-masking, I found, I found or, or for more misinformation, revealing. Yeah. slightly revealing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just did a quick quick search, and there's a uh, a paper in the uh, journal Humor: Chimpanzee and Gorilla Humor: Progressive Emergence from Origins in the Wild to Captivity to Sign Language Learning, and it examines is from 2018 examining mainly anecdotal evidence related to the experience mm -hmm. of humor among chimpanzees and gorillas in the wild. Um, humor is defined as one form of symbolic play. Uh, what do they say? <sighs> Positive evidence of object permanence, cross modal perception, deferred imitation and deception among chimpanzees and gorillas is used to document their cognitive capacity for humor. Playful teasing is proposed as the primordial form of humor among apes in the wild. Uh, this form of humor is commonly found among signing apes, both in overt behavior and in signed communications. A second form of humor emerges, emerges in the context of captivity, consisting of throwing feces at human onlookers who often respond to this with laughter. Mm -hmm. This early form of humor shows up in signing apes in the form of calling others dirty, a sign associated with feces. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's so, hilarious. Anecdotal, probably, you know, it's just reviewing stuff, but that's funny. <laughs> of course. So, now so, I, so when I... they're throwing feces, it's funny to the apes. <laughs> Possibly. Well, because they're getting that they're getting the reaction, which is also yeah. interesting. Yeah. It, now I've I've got this whole train of thought of like uh, of like is there a correlation between uh, having a sense of humor and critical thinking? And I think there probably For is. Sure. Uh, this yes. is my my in, am I getting yeah. But I've also then thought about the perception of intelligence with uh, with humor. Like I think I assume funny people are more intelligent than, than they are. I think I, I have this, this uh, innate sense. And, and, and I, it may, uh, this is just a train of thought thing going on. Ricky Gervais, who I think is a very intelligent person. I am just now analyzing my own appreciation of him as he's not only somebody who, who tells funny jokes that are like well-crafted at times, but he's somebody who's, who has a, a propensity to laugh at his own joke while he's telling it. Which yeah. then also sort of shows a form of intelligence because he's getting the joke. Yes, he already knows it and he's the one telling it, but he's also laughing at it because he gets why it's funny in the same time. So that might be that combination of laughing at your own joke might make it somebody seem or doesn't. Could just be good, to, you know, crafting the absurd, but I think it does. This, there are not good, somebody was mentioning it in the chat before. Yeah, there's not really good conservative comedians. Especially modern day conservatism well, it, is very. It, it all depends on it, what you find funny. Because there are conservative com comedians that people find funny. It's just you're not, you're in a, you're in a different echo chamber. chamber. Yeah. I mean, I guess outside of like, you know. Like what? It, it just seems like when I've heard conservative comedy attempts, it seemed to be like it seemed either ill-informed uh, about the constructs of the jokes that they were telling, or just meanness. It just it had like this base, like attempted meanness on some sort of social pretext that I didn't agree with. That's all. I want to. I, I want to like, go find. I don't like humor mean humor. Yeah, I don't like mean humor. And there, and everybody, there's like a ton of mean humor on every side, but it seems like a very specific. Like I feel like okay. there's probably a lot of great craftsmen of jokes uh, out there in the conservative community, but 
But, mm-hmm. you know, how many racist jokes do we really need? Dude, none. We need none. <laughs> Those get none. No. I really don't. Really don't. Really don't. Aside don't need from them. that, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that there's. Um, on another note, do you want to hear about uh, what mealworm flour is made out of? Yes. Okay. Everybody's been waiting the whole show oh, to know God. the answer to this question, Blair. Okay. Great. Um, mealworm flour includes yellow mealworm powder, 100%. It's all mealworms. How to make mealworm flour using prepared mealworms. (laughs) Toast them. (laughs) Yep. Put them in a food processor. Yep. Let cool. Yum. That's it. Mealworm flour. Where's the gluten? No gloopin. No gloopin. No. Um, here, I want to look at mealworm flour replacement. Do you have to add, I mean, I guess eggs? What are the binding agents? So you. Yeah. That's like an egg or a banana. Yeah. Yeah. You would do that. Yeah. Banana, Mm. if you're trying to do a vegan thing, I guess. Mealworm. Mm, so nutty. I'm trying to figure out, is it one to one? Um, mealworm flour, one to one. I have never baked with mealworms. I will say it right now. Admit. So I have no idea what the <laughs> what the conversion ratio is. Um, insect flour. <clears throat> you were actually there. Tasty, actually, they're bland. Well, but isn't no, they're nutty. Bland? It is nutty. It tastes it very nutty. nutty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. it has and like if a, it's bland, that probably flavor. means you just it, your recipe yeah. needed more in it. <laughs> yep. It depends on what you're you making. Like if you're making cookies, it's mostly sugar and butter anyway, so <laughs> it shouldn't even matter what kind of flour you use. Cookies should just taste good because of all the sugar and butter. So this says you can use cricket powder in a ratio of one to four with normal flour to goose up the, the protein one in your to four. Yeah. Could you just replace it entirely. Yeah, but also cricket flour can be a one to one. Okay. Huh? So you can beef up the protein in your snacks, your sweets, your sweet yeah. treats, or just wild. Just do it. Wild. That's um, I tried to get my mom bread. to eat a uh, mealworm cookie once and she wouldn't do it. And I was like, what? You eat shrimp? <laughs> <laughs> They're basically the same. <laughs> she didn't like that. <laughs> um, Kiki, did you update our website? What? It just looks different. I did like months ago. Is yeah. this the first time you've been to it? <laughs> no, no, no. I keep meaning to ask you. Okay, yeah, months ago. Yeah, I'm like, wait, I keep something- to ask you about it, and then I just wait. I don't hang on, wait. When did we get a website? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Sure, sure, sure. Waka 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 waka. Ooh, be here Charles. All- <laughs> Charles says fried insects are a nice snack. With cold beer. Yeah, I mean, I'm all about putting them in the flour. I just don't, I don't know if I could handle it. Every time I've eaten them as is, it's like, I feel like I can feel the legs in my <laughs> And I know I probably can't. I know that's probably not true. Or maybe you can and you should just pull, probably pull the legs true. off of them. <laughs> Or you could, I, I mean, a little bit of um, a little habanero it might be a salt learning curve. on a cricket. That might be tasty. A little lime a and curve. habanero. Like, ah, mm. I've been trying to eat chicken. Like, oh, I hear all these people like, oh, chicken's great. I love chicken. But what, I keep, keep spitting out cricket. feathers. Like, when you keep choking on, I keep choking on the feathers when I eat chicken. I don't understand. See, like, yeah, there's maybe steps that. Uh, yes, to learning. I didn't cook them. <sighs> oh my! Somebody else cooked them. Ah, uh, people talking—they like fish. 
Yeah, I was like all the with all the bones and the scales and all that crunching going on. Ah, forget it. Yuck, 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 yuck. <sighs> Might be. <laughs> I'm gonna go down a humor rabbit hole. I've like I'm like, ooh, research papers on comedy and critical thought. Yeah. I want to see that. This paper published in Contemporary Political Theory, Comedy and Critical Thought, Laughter as Resistance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because there's all these, like, there's a bazillion uh, comedy political satire uh, shows. Like, every, every late night show is now doing, like, the Jon Stewart type political comedy satire. Mm -hmm. Uh, takes on the news, all this stuff. It's like, uh, it's you can't do, you almost can't do it. One of those shows without having that there, and they all have uh, a very uh, strong uh, fact basis. Yeah, in, in their approaches. The I haven't seen the the right wing version of that. Why aren't there a dozen shows where they're using comedy from the right to talk about the news? Yeah. So the so yeah. this kind of get this kind of gets Maybe at it too. a little bit is um so it, there's a few paragraphs here um, one here uh, so, so it talks about a subject the suggestive conflation of um, subverting uh, so people laughing together often seems threatening signifying a kind of antisocial collectivity a point of view not commonly available a subverting of the normal stitching of politics this suggest suggestive conflation also underlies the power of the medieval jester the coyote trickster the greek cynic the literary satirist and in our own time the late night television comedian all of whom possess a tremendous power the ability to say the unsayable, to confront hypocrisy, to kick the. Can I say that on YouTube? I hmm. must not say that word, but it's in a it's in a paper. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it goes on to talk about how you have to take in for humor. It has to take in. You have to take into account its profoundly reactive qualities. The laughs. The laughs also serve to keep others in their place. The subjects of jokes. Jokes are often minorities more often minorities than governments the cutting edge of wit can exile and humiliate teenagers mobilize humor against the misfit the nerd the overweight the already outcast this would seem an odd fit for critique cruelty against the weak does not comport with the uncovering of the truth from the exigencies and productions of capitalist cultural consumerism comedy also punched down is yeah, the... comedy also operates under a second set of procedures which misfit critical thinking. Critique requires distance from its subject, whereas humor operates through immersion. And it goes on to say comedic tropes in uh, in contrast to... Oh, let's see. I keep trying to skip stuff, but then there's good stuff. <laughs> Discovery, the procedures of seeing how things operate and the actuality, the structural truth of oppression in any given situation underpin critical thought. What is behind the curtain is real. The curtain itself must be abolished. Comedic tropes, in contrast, revel in the play between reality, intentionality, and meaning, irony, sarcasm, exaggeration, slapstick. Critique operates structurally and narratively, while humor surprises surprises and undercuts. So they're kind of, anyway, critical thinking, very important for comedy, but they maybe are two sides of a coin. Anyway, I'm fascinated by this. I'm like, what's in there now? Rabbit hole for Kiki. Yeah. <sighs> Humor. Is it funny? Is it funny yet? La, 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 la. Hmm. Uh, I remember, uh, Iron Lord, there was a right-wing show in the late 90s, early aughts. What was that? The Colbert there was Report? was a late-night show? What are you talking the about? The Colbert Report. Yeah. Because <laughs> that was, I mean, that was marketed as right-wing, but the the joke was that. <laughs> yeah, and, and what was funny is that there were people who couldn't tell. Yeah, like, yeah. Like the uh, Chinese news outlets... Uh, they republished a story about uh, the leader of North Korea uh, being uh, being voted uh, a fashion icon, 
in the West, uh, which was an onion story, but they didn't <laughs> get the joke. Yeah. <clears throat> they did not get the humor part. Yeah, Paul that. Disney, to successfully make fun of a thing, you must understand a thing. Yeah. 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 I mean... I, I think ha, ha, I think ha, ha. I like testicles joke. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, uh, test tickle. Yes. Uh, uh, so there's, uh, what is it? I don't like uh, political jokes. Usually frown mm -hmm. upon political jokes, mostly because they keep getting elected. But um, very funny. I like it. Yeah, I don't know if there's an algorithm. You, you might be able to teach AI to slow down misinformation, uh, anti-vax messaging. Um, you know, yeah, but I mean, that would be a bot farm, most likely. <laughs> Twitter mm -hmm. tries Twitter tries to get rid of bot farms, so I don't know how far that would go, unless it were specifically uh, Twitter managing it, and they may be using uh, algorithms in in addition to their human. Um, filters. Who is it? Wait, who is it? Twitter. Uh, yeah. Timid, Timid a... Tenor. Timid Tenor was saying about the Twitter analysis um, and the researchers developing an algorithm to identify anti-vaxxers. Yeah. So, so what was also interesting, uh, this is a side thing, but it was in the disclaimer I mentioned, uh, China posts 500 million pro-government uh uh, social messages a year uh, with fake accounts. They actually don't use bots. <laughs> they actually have humans. People, yeah. That are sitting and writing those messages. Uh, the Russian system tends to rely heavily on bots. Yeah. Uh, which can make it more confusing. Like, Ah, congratulations on tremendous victory in the, the Ukraine over the it was, it was like, oh, but they wait, that just came out before the before they invaded. Oops. Oh well. What are you gonna do? <laughs> timing. Uh, timing there, is everything. No, but there is also there is uh, a, a misinformation campaign from Russia, which has been exposed, and some of the people who worked in it have talked about it, where they would be managing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of, of fake name accounts. And posting, they would get sort of these things that they were supposed to post about. And then would post, often having that conversation. You know how we said which you're making these points for your own audience? They would create this back and forth with their own, creating the sense of audience about it, uh, where they were creating an echo chamber, which they would then uh, insert information into. It was one yeah. of the interesting things too. Like the Chinese government will also like specifically be like, we need, you know, 20,000 tweets about this event. We're going to have this celebration over here. We want it. And so they can actually make something seem like it's news by having, right. oh gosh, all of my fellow country people apparently are, are all talking about this amazing thing and all of it's manufactured. I need that. I need a science communicator army. At my bidding. No, I don't. <laughs> Discussing science everywhere. <laughs> Test Tickle has another joke. <laughs> You're full of the jokes. Always full of the jokes. Oh, in our uh, Discord, Charles is showing pictures of the fried insects and the cold beer and says Blair is right, though. They are leggy. <laughs> so you'd either have to pull the legs off or um, or just eat them. They just, yep, they look like little little fried crickets. 
That's what that looks like there. Do they have spices on them? I hope they would have spices on them. That would be delicious. Salty, crunchy, leggy snacks. Maybe you can, Blair, you could um, get in early and start like the Doritos of the um, fried insect chip world. Uh -huh. Hmm. <laughs> they have curb chips. And what are they called? It'll be, it'll be called leggy. Chips. What are they called? <laughs> no, it'll be called chirps. 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 Maybe that is what they're called. <laughs> and then instead of instead of like crumbs at the chirps bottom of the chip. bag, it's all the legs. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. Yikers. <laughs> yeah. Curps chips. Hi, Katie. Hi. Wait, what is it? What do they? What do they call it? Chirps. Chips. Oh, see, they miss it. They should just call them oh, chirps. Chirps. Sorry, chirps. They chips. are chirps. I can't talk anymore. I'm done okay, talking. Blair's done. <laughs> chirps. Chips. Chirps. Oh. By the way, for those who are just them. listening via the podcast, uh, no. uh, uh, they Blair won't be. is it's now show. heavily drinking. Uh, uh, she's she's gotten into the bourbon. And she's been now. She's taking shots. The after shows not on uh, the podcast, silly. Oh, is it not? Okay, never it is mind. for the Patreons. It is. Aww. Chirps are temporarily that. out of stock. Oh yeah, Patreons get the there after show in in audio format. In audio format. Oh, I didn't know that because some people don't want to go to the YouTubes or the Twitters. I mean, or the Twitches or the yeah. So no, it's all full of audio. misinformation. Uh, I hear. Eat. Bugs. Ooh, I want sriracha. Sriracha cricket chips. Yeah, I had that one. That was pretty good. I kind of want to eat that. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's like that's just sriracha you're eating at that point because these people put that on everything. I don't really <laughs> no. care for it. You know, it's just fine because I don't have to put it on my thing. Thankfully, it's not an ingredient. It's just something you can put on a food. But yeah, it's like, oh yeah, I do sriracha ice cream is great. It's like, no, it's just stop. Just drink, just take it, just make turn it into a drink. Just drink sriracha and don't even bother putting it on a thing. That's just unnecessary. I I eat just uh I I now just eat sour cream. I don't even put it on a thing anymore. I That's just grab a, bit a little much, Justin. You're canceled. <laughs> Do you hear that guy? He's playing that sour cream. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, oh, what do I want today? I know what I want. I'm gonna have my. I'm gonna have bowl Mexican sour food. Sour cream. Sour cream. I'm have a, I'm have a bowl of sour cream. You know, no, it's a little early in the day for that. I think I'll just eat a block of cream cheese. Yeah, I think that's what I'll do. Justin, you gotta right, go. I'm so sorry. Something? You gotta go. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> put it on anything. No, I don't need to. I don't really need to. Uh, it is a doge on a chair, kind of a go. Yeah. She okay. likes her chair. What? Did I wish, you get a new I, wish dog? I could show you what my cat looks Did like. Did you get a new it's dog? So what do you mean? That's not Sadie. It's Sadie. Yeah. What are you talking about? Well, Sadie's a cute, tiny little Papadini dog. What is that? <laughs> That's a full size dog. She's two and a half. What are you talking about? I don't think I've seen like uh, Sadie in a full shot for for a, you know a year and a half. He's or like something. a whole dog now. Yeah, I thought you were like one of those little pretend dogs. No. Mm -hmm. My cat is chirping at me from a floor from the floor and showing me her chinchilla belly. Tell her she's not a cricket. Yeah, no chirps. Stuff. She's she is. She goes. Pr, pr. She has cat chirps. <sighs> no chirps. <laughs> no chirps. Uh, we're just holding hands. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, oh, somebody points out Tim Allen is a conservative. I see ones in Alaska. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oaxaca. Tim Allen, yes. But I can't I can't picture any of Tim Allen's comedy. I know he did comedy. Maybe the Hill stuff. was funny. I don't really I mean though. Mike, you think Mike Judge? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Judge. I don't know. I I think like uh yeah, maybe. 
I don't think King of the Hill was conservative. I think like no, it definitely wasn't. That show no. was definitely it made fun of conservatism quite a bit. Yeah, I think it was more just like not all people with Southern accents are conservative. Is really what that show was about. Well, they ain't gonna talk about that. They ain't gonna boom higher, man. You know, we're just talking like this, making fun of this baby real brown Texas. <laughs> I knew somebody who talked like Boomhauer Oof. for a while. There's a chirping cat, but she's not going to chirp because she's annoyed because I picked her up. Okay, go look cute over there again. It's because you got the cat the cat vaccine. I'm telling you, the, when you when they, the when they inoculate vaccine. the cats at the, at the vet, it turns them into a socially unresponsive. Uh, I want to go see the Aurora in Alaska. That would be great. Would love to see the Aurora Borealis. I've never seen that. Larry the Cable Guy. I like Larry the Cable Guy. He's just he's a nice guy. I've never seen it. Larry, Larry's a Larry's a good good cable guy. Hair's falling out. Let's see. Uh Charles wants to know, are we watching Raised by Wolves? Sci-fi TV. No, show. I have mm -mm. not uh started that one. I watched a lot of the first season just kind of was a bit too dystopian for me it was a bit much mm -hmm. like, like there's Good a spoilers, lot now I that i find that. i'm not going to say anything it's it's interesting it's an interesting show um yeah i enjoyed it for a little bit and then i was like ah, i'm done now <laughs> which happens i a lot of dystopian sci-fi that's where i find myself is like uh, I don't need to watch that because it's a little too real or possible seeming. I don't know, even though it's not. But I prefer recently, I'm just delving into uh, supernatural fantasy. Give me vampires, witches, like, you know, I don't want anything like no pandemics, mm -hmm. <laughs> no super intelligent AI. Nope. Yeah. I want witches, I want vampires, werewolves. Just I'll take that. That's good. That's good. Yes, exactly. I, like I live this. Why would I watch it, R and Lore? Yeah. Except for science. I mean, you're not this is real good stuff, not dystopian. We're talking about things here, right? Like chirp chips. Yes. Chirp chips. Chirps. Aaron, Laura, I think I've seen that video that you linked in the Discord. And since it's in Discord, you also linked it. I know you linked it in the in the Twitch chat. Um, I will try and watch it because I think I've seen it before, but I will I will watch it. It is titled Why is Conservative Comedy So Not Very Good? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll check that out. Do you need the link, Justin? To the video. Yeah. He's slowly trying to transcribe it. Hold up. This is going to transfer you. Do you want to go there? Yes. I'm going to turn that off. And then I'm going to type this. And then I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to. Oh, I can't. I don't know how to send it to you, Justin. I'm done. The internet's hard. <laughs> Wait. Where'd Justin go? Mm. Did he just leave? I didn't see him say or do anything that would make me think he would just leave. I didn't do that to him, did I? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? He's like, yep, then he was gone. He's like, I'll take that cue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Oh man. Oh no. I'm sorry, R and Lore. What happened? Uh he lives in Pennsylvania where Dr. Oz is visiting to pick up endorsements. Oh boy. <laughs> <sighs> oh, he yes. will be back. He, yeah, maybe just oh there he is. What happened? Hi, what happened to you? Hit the wrong button. You hit the wrong button. Okay, I was wondering. Like, what yeah. happened? <laughs> <laughs> Kaiva Go says you yawned off. I did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, who's yawning now? <laughs> B 
we could make a song for that. <laughs> All right, what was this video? I'm so, what am I supposed to see? Where's my link? What am I doing? I don't know. I don't know how to get it. Just look for why is conservative comedy so not very good? Huh. <laughs> And then watch that. <clears throat> Ooh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Sounds like it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to the new Tolkien. Um, oh, yes. <gasps> the Lord of the Rings thing. What's it called? It's called. It's the, it's, it's the book. T it's the prequel. Something the of the ring. I forget what it's called. Ring yeah. time. Ring time. Fun time. <laughs> Every time, fun time. Oh, <laughs> that's not what it's called. Oh, it's new, oh, somebody sent me the. Oh, that link is the news daddy. That's my news daddy. That's Cody. That's, oh, Cody, that's your news daddy. Uh, I don't understand. I was pretty close. It's called the Rings of Power. Oh, news daddy. The ring daddy. Uh, ring time, fun time. Yeah, yeah. That's like the. Uh, that's like the, the. My favorite show, actually. That's the only cool. reason I have the YouTubes uh, still installed. What show? Is, uh, the Cody Shody uh, says I'm It's the Cody Shody. It's the Cody Shody with the news daddy, Cody, who's always talking about uh, mm. some more news. And and it's also, it's like, a and there's Warmbo, and there's time travel involved, and um, it's really the best show that's ever existed. All right. I have never watched... Maybe I don't, I don't think I ever watched Cody before. Maybe I'll have to try Cody. Yeah, that's it's so my favorite. That's the show. I think if you want to know where I get all of my material about what's going on in the world, uh, the oh, the insights you are that, not <laughs> the insights that Justin have. It's this YouTuber guy who says all these things, and it's he's amazing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. To, uh, uh -huh. Write about everything. Uh, that's my news daddy right there though your that's news dope. daddy oh my yeah. goodness um in other news ring time fun i time even got the merch i even got the merch it was, a, it was a pen it didn't last very long actually wait kinda... what's ring time fun time oh the lord of the rings the rings of power <laughs> and you're you're sad that it's not called ring time fun time aren't you no it's i'm just gonna keep calling you that but it comes out september 2nd 2022 so <laughs> Mm, I want it sooner. I know, me too. I'm looking at the cast. I actually don't yeah. really see any super familiar A-list faces, which I'm really happy about. <laughs> I thought there were A-list faces. I thought that was part of the big deal. Unless I'm I'm not recognizing someone from this list. Oh, like I recognize man. some of these faces as just like, oh, I've seen you around, but not oh. like oh yeah, like um Na Nazanin Bo Boniadi. I've seen mm -hmm. her in things. But um not what a am bunch. I thinking of then because I saw like some maybe there's Mm. Maybe there's something else. Oh, Kev B wants us to make characters and get some Star Trek or sci fi DD &D game. Oh, you're talking about what's it called? Yeah, but that's what Star you were talking about. What? Star oh, there's what's it called? Chat room. Come on. The, the sci fi DD &D called Star or something. I've played it before. Um,. There's an Expanse game, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, what's it? There's a, there's a famous one. Starfinder, says yep. Aaron Lore. Correct. That's what I played. That was very fun. What yeah, is, we were talking about D&D &D last week. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Fantasy TV shows 2022. What do I have to look forward to? Nothing. Actually, oh, I want to see uh, the Legends of Vox Machina. That yes. looks good. It's great. I, awesome. That's that's a D and D campaign that they turned into a show, and it's um, awesome. it looks it's awesome. pretty fun because you can tell like when someone fails a role or something, 
you know, because like that's obviously not baked into it, right? It's like a half hour TV show with the cartoons, but yeah, you can tell like, oh, they tripped and fell, they rolled a one on that. Like it's just kind of fun <laughs> if you've played a lot of D and D, then you can like see it and you can kind of put yourself in the position of how how it would have played out. It's great because it like it really gives you an idea of of kind of your theater of the mind. Uh, Gord says, mind. just don't let the kiddo watch. I was watching yes. the... Oh, really? Yes. Okay. I just thought that it had a few F-bombs. No, it's very bloody, and there's also um, nudity and sex, and uh, oh. so there's, oh, some really, they... there's some really heartbreaking um, gory stuff in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking in, that we could, we could Star let Trek? Kai watch it, but no. In a Star Trek thing? No, no, not in Star Trek. No. <laughs> in the, okay. Where are you I was in the no. chat room and I thought you were talking because that's it. So Star Trek Adventures also looks. This is Gordon in the chat room. Star Trek Adventures also looks very good. Just don't let the kiddos <laughs> oh, watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I missed the thing where you were talking about something else. The Legend of Vox Machina. Uh, don't know what this is. Uh, but I got to roll. The D&D uh, campaign come to life which is what we were talking about. Ah, yes. that's the name of the thing. I missed the yes. name of the thing. We were yeah. talking about. I got a roll. Uh, I will see you guys hopefully next Say week. Say hello to, yeah. the, to the family. The bundle. The, yeah. the, bundle, the, yes. the bundle and the mama. Say hello. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate the uh, the feedback on the, the appropriateness of the show. I would have okay. been surprised suddenly yeah. and gone, oh, no. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. that. Everyone ready to have the good nights? Yeah. The morning, the good mornings. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good, good night. night, Kiki. Kiki. <sighs> I'm already asleep. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Twists and our after show. Always a fun conversation. We hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week and that you stay safe. Oh, uh, stay curious. And you can join me Friday at 11 a.m. for a conversation um, with Anna Manchin, who has written a book about the science of love. <gasps> uh. So if you would like to dis like to hear about the science of love, I will be broadcasting at 11 a.m with a half hour interview. So anyway, stay safe, stay curious, stay well. We'll see you next week.